Hi, this is Anne-Marie Hoftailing with the Millionaire Girls Movement, and today I'm very delighted to be with Elisa Camahort page COO and co-founder of Blogger, who's going to talk to us today about sort of the evolution of Blogger and where they began and where they're going and what's happening now. So thank you so much for being here, Elisa, and welcome. Oh, thank you so much, Anne-Marie. It's my pleasure to be here. So for those of us out there who don't know about your evolution, I know you sort of started in a corporate world, but if you wouldn't mind just telling us a little bit about the history of Blogger and how you began with your partners and what was sort of the big vision when you started out. Sure, and and I have a, you know, personally have what I might call a checkered past. This is really my fourth career. Um, And at the time uh, that we founded Blogger, I had been in high tech, through um, through most of the dot com boom and then um, through the bust, uh, I was actually working in hardware and telecom equipment, so wasn't quite dot commy myself. Um, mm-hmm. And somewhere around 2003, I got really burnt out and frustrated and kind of done. They did yet another round of layoffs at the company I was working at, and and I found myself depressed all weekend that I wasn't laid off, and I figured that was a really pretty bad sign. Um, And I went in on Monday and asked if it was too late to get on the list. And it turned into it wasn't quite that simple, and we ended up negotiating a six-week transition, but I did get an excellent package, and I consulted with them for a while, but I I basically freed myself. And I always like to point out that um, I had been pretty frugal all my life, so I had um, some savings um, racked up, and that was what allowed me the freedom to say, I'm, I'm so unhappy that I'm depressed that I, I have a job. Um, so I'm always a big one for telling people to save, save their pennies and, and give themselves that freedom. Um, and then I sort of thought I was just going to take time off and and regroup and then go back and get another job in the industry where I'd established myself. But I just wasn't doing it. I wasn't. I was reacting if someone reached out to me, but I wasn't proactively making anything happen. And and I thought about that too. And I'm like, this is really not like me. And what does this mean that I have no desire actually to go find myself another job in this industry? And um, <coughs> excuse me, I have a little cold. Um, so lo- about that time, I started blogging purely for personal reasons, and um, I had what I like to call my peanut butter and chocolate moment, where I realized that blogs could actually be a really excellent communications tool, and they could really be used for very uh, custom marketing um, and connection with um, with companies and with organizations that really wanted to build an audience and build a following. And so ha- having never previously thought of myself as someone who would start my own company, I decided to, to try my hand at consultancy. Uh, around social media, and this was still pretty early in the game. I don't even think we were calling it social media back then. It was 2004, early 2004. Mm -hmm. And so that's what I was doing. And towards the end of 2004, and I was also doing a lot of political blogging, and I had a friend who um, said, you need to meet my friend Lisa Stone. You guys would really hit it off. And he kept telling her the same thing. And I and I actually think that, that we were very into blogging and we were each very into politics. And I think he was really just tired of us talking to him about it and wanted to redirect <laughs> our, our energies to one another. And we finally um, kept missing each other. And we finally decided to just go have lunch together. And along the way, we started talking about this um article a blog post that basically asked where are the women who blog and, and it was a rhetorical question because the thesis of the blogger was that women don't really blog especially if it means having to debate or mix it up they can't take the rough and tumble exchange of ideas pat 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 on the head and um and we were both kind of outraged and appalled and and um you know and Lisa said to me you know I was thinking what do you think do you think anyone would be interested if you did a conference that it was just the same as any other blogging conference or tech conference, but it just so happened that all the experts and speakers were women? And I said, well, I would go to that. And I said, you know, we should just do that. And she's like, okay, let's do that. And then it was really that quick a decision. We just said, okay, let's do that. And um, we blogged the idea, and it turned out lots of other women were sort of um, waiting for <laughs> uh, to be galvanized, I think. Uh, along the way, very, very shortly, we realized, wow, this is a lot more, this is a lot of work. 
and three heads would be better than two. And I had met my other co-founder, Joy Desjardins, sitting next to her at a conference. And I remembered her, and I said, oh, I was talking to this other woman who was really cool. Let's see if she'd be interested in helping out. And she was actually the one who said, so how are you paying for all of this? And um, and we said, well, it's $99 for the day. And she's like, are you, <laughs> are you, are you feeding people? Are you? Is there going to be Internet? Are you going to have microphones, AV? You know, are you going to... Um, uh, are, you, are you going to have a, a welcome conference bag? I mean, what what are you what are you expecting that you can provide for that ninety nine dollars a day? <laughs> and we were like, oh, she's like, you need my help, and we're like, we we need your help. <laughs> so, um, so that's how the three of us came together. One hundred and twenty days after the first blog post saying, hey, we're thinking of doing this, we had our first blog her conference, three hundred people. Uh, we sold out the Tech Mart in Santa Clara um, with three hundred people and. Um, really, that was all. That was as far as we were looking. We didn't even we didn't form a company or anything. We just were these three right. chicks with credit cards who put a deposit on a meeting space and announced it on a blog and did it. It was only after the conference they were like, "Wow, there's a lot of energy and passion and community here. Um, what should we do next?" Yeah, you know what I love about what you just said is I I feel very much the same. I mean, I started my own company and started the Millionaire Girls Movement not because there was some grand business plan where I sat down with, you know, someone and had this great strategy. It was like, hey, there's this hole, let's go fill it. Um, and it is, it's interesting. Did you, At what point or did you ever sort of sit down and come up with a business plan or strategy for where you were going? I mean, clearly it organically grows and you have some strategic meetings along the way. But was there a point at which you sort of sat down after that conference and said, okay, what's our business plan for this? Or was it something that you guys just grew into organically? No, I think after the conference we sat down at Lisa's kitchen table and we had all this feedback from – blog posts from the post-conference survey and from emails we had each received. Um, there was no Twitter back then, so there, mm -hmm. you know, I can only imagine how much more feedback we would have been sifting through. Um, and we sat down with all of this feedback and all this energy, and, and there were really three main thrusts of the feedback. And the first was, oh, my God, meeting in person really is awesome. And, you know, even if we all live online, to meet face to face, you can't replace it. It's it's fantastic. When's the next event? The second piece of feedback was, but I wish I could find people every day. Like I had no idea there were other women who cared about knitting with organic yarn, you know, or I had no idea there were other women who were blogging about infertility or whatever it might be. I just found a tribe that I didn't know really existed, and I wish I could go every day and find what people were saying and who was blogging about that. So where there's no destination, and. Um, and then the third piece of feedback, which was sort of uh, number three in priority, in, in other words, a smaller subset asked about it, but they still asked about it, which is, I found something I love, and I think I'm pretty good at it. Why can't I make money? Where is the business model for me? Google AdSense is just, it's pennies, right? So it's not, it's not really working, but I feel like it should work. I feel like we should be able to make this work. And so from there, we pretty quickly decided, you know what, there is a company here, and we got pretty serious about it from the beginning. You know, we got a lawyer to drop our LLC papers. We hired, um, you know, pretty soon hired someone else to do the accounting and numbers because that wasn't, none of us were sort of qualified. We took it seriously pretty much from that point when we decided to keep going. The whole first four months when we were building the event and creating a, a centerpiece for a community was very organic and very, we took mm -hmm. the event very seriously, of course, but we weren't really thinking beyond that point. But once we decided to form a company, we we treated it pretty seriously and buttoned up from the beginning. You know, you make a point about talking about the monetization. I think it comes up for a lot of women. I hear this a lot. You know, I have, you know, 40,000 followers. People love me. I'm fabulous. Everyone loves me. Where's the money? Like, where, how do I monetize? That tends to be the question for most um, women out there. So I'm wondering if you could just talk a little bit about giving women direction about that and who have, who are incredibly engaged with social media, who seem to have a brand, a direction, a very distinct point of view, and are still struggling with the monetization piece. They're building something, but they don't know what. Hmm. What would you tell them? Well, I think that I do see this a lot. I I think you have to a few things. When I started my own consultancy, 
the first thing I did was go. I had an idea that it would blogging would and online community would be very valuable for arts organizations, who typically have pretty low budgets and typically want to build an audience and have to do something to stay engaged in between performances or showings or whatever. So I went to somebody I knew who ran a little theater company, and I offered if he would give me a discount code with which to track um, whether I was successful in selling the show. I would do a program for him for free. All he had to do was give me access and a discount code, and I would do the rest. And there was really no loss for him, right? They gave discount codes other reasons, so there's no reason not to give me one. And what I got out of that was a case study, and I could validate I gave him this many more new names for his mailing list. I sold um, this many tickets. I, this was the cost per ticket. It's cheaper than some of the other routes of marketing he was taking. All my ticket sales were driven to an online box office, which was more cost effective than the brick and mortar um, box office. He sold, you know, to more tickets earlier in the cycle because word of mouth was starting before opening night even hit. So I had this little case study that, I, and I did it for free, right? And then I took it to other theater companies and I said, here's what I can do for me, for you and got more clients that way. And so in general, I think understanding um, your value is really important, but it doesn't mean you don't ever do something uh, to, to establish a case study. What happens instead is that people uh, are sometimes are constantly doing free things, thinking that the next one will be the one that somehow is going to have a big impact, um, but what they're really doing is driving down their ability to charge money. Um, the other thing they do is they price themselves. Um, I see this all the time with bloggers who want to get sponsorship from companies to go to our events, and they price it based on what their expenses are instead of pricing it based on what value they're going to bring. Well, it's none of it's none of a customer's, you know, it's none of a sponsor's business whether you end up sharing a room and saving money, whether you end up doing something. Um, you know, more cost effective along the way for your expenses. You should be pricing your services, not your expenses. And, and that applies when I was a consultant. I was always trying to move away from charging on an hourly basis and going towards a project basis because I don't want to be penalized because I'm a fast worker would be, you know, my internal rationale, right? So, um, I feel like that people have to think through, you're not just you know, blogging or tweeting for someone. You're doing marketing writing and you're doing outreach and then you're doing analysis and reporting and you're phrase what you're doing in terms that marketers understand. Um, to, uh, call out what your services are, not the function, not the fact that you're typing a blog post, or, but what, the, what is the function of doing that? That's what they're paying for um, is the, the service and the function and that's how you price based on that value and and I really suggest trying to move towards that kind of way of thinking about what you're doing. Yeah, I think I don't disagree with you. There's a there's a huge gap between that idea of value and worthiness as well and being okay with sort of, you know, making your number and sticking by your number and yeah. being able to defend it, you know, and sort yeah. of say, hey, this is my number and it's defensible. And I also agree with you. There are times and places to do something for nothing when you are creating the terms so that you can leverage it as a tool to get something larger. I think too often what happens is people get stuck in this thing like, oh, well, if you do this for free, for sure you'll get all this business. Well, that doesn't work because – all of the onus is on them then to provide this referral business for you. And good luck with that. I mean, that's not, you know, that's a pretty fragile model. But I agree with you. There are times and places when you do it consciously and strategically that make a lot of sense. Right. right. So where do you see Blog Her going? I mean, what what do you want to happen next? Well, you know, we consider Blog Her to be the network and the event and the publishing outlet, and really the media company that the community is building with us. And we are, we like to say that we are making money with women and not off of women. And that's pretty rare in women's media. And um, so we want to continue to expand how we help our community achieve economic empowerment. It's part of our mission. We, and that means there's still a lot of directions for us to go. I mean, just the blogosphere alone has changed so significantly that it's not really about just blogs anymore. We have influence that's being expressed across many different platforms now and many different formats. 
um, you know, and, and including video and audio and on, you know, that can go online, that can start to go offline. And, you know, uh, so there's still so many ways we can expand, I, I guess, kind of horizontally and vertically uh, to continue to be that media company that women built that, uh, that, you know, continues to partner with women um, to achieve their goals, some of which are economic and some of which are not economic but are still very important. So in the midst of developing this in this particular market, in this particular time place with technology growing faster than we can possibly <laughs> even keep up and, you know, catch our breath, what do you think the greatest challenge for you is right now with the business? Honestly, the biggest challenge, and I think most people, if they're being honest, would agree that one of the biggest challenges is going to be the macroeconomic issues. Mm -hmm. I mean, we... Um, we have two customer bases, right? Our first customer base, obviously, is the women in our community, and women and men, you know, our community. They're consumers, and they are challenged by the economy at a consumer level. But our other set of customers are B2C companies that are trying to reach those consumers. And so when the consumers are challenged, those companies are challenged too. And, um, you know, so both our sets of customers are working through um, this this economic recovery, and uh, I think that that's and and I think it's still volatile. I think we still don't really have a sense that we know. Well, in one year's time, everything's going to be and you know, everything's coming up roses. I don't think we really know the trajectory, and and I think it's very broad how it's impacting from the housing market to um, consumer spending uh, and to real income. You know, so. Uh, that just adds a level of um, complexity and volatility and unpredictability, I guess, to our entire plan. And, and, and there's, a, there's a portion of it that's out of our control. I mean, the thing that we love is that by working with women to help them make money, we are contributing. We feel like we are contributing to the economic recovery by providing women with more income and, therefore, more ability to participate in the economy. Um, but, you know, I, I think that's a challenge. And the other challenge would be that the online, um, <clears throat> the online monetization space, that's what I'll call it as opposed to advertising, the online monetization space, as you said, is so rapidly evolving, both in formats, in technology, in platforms. We do our best to try to stay agnostic. We don't care what blog platform our bloggers use. We don't care what social media tool they use to promote their work and distribute their work. We work with them all. We, we, whatever new tool comes along, we're right away like, how can we integrate this into our plans? Um, but still, you know, it means you're constant, it's the pressure of being constantly agile. Um, and agile to where people are going. You know, our whole mojo is um, go to where the people are and integrate and, and talk to them, <laughs> like real people out there where they are. And all of these tools have a slightly different ambiance, really. People use them for different purposes. Therefore, the environment is different. Therefore, your marketing message has to be different. And keeping on top of that, you're just having to be incredibly – Agile on the one hand, and yet because of the macroeconomic um, concerns, you're also having to be incredibly mindful and lean so you're prepared, you know. So it's, an, it's a very, um, uh, I would say, challenging but in a kind of exciting kind of way environment to be in business. And on that note, what's the most exciting part of the business for you? I mean, what's really, for you personally, turning you on in terms of how you're engaging the business and where you see it going? What's the most exciting part for you? Well, I think that there, the most exciting part is is when we really step back and look at what, um, you know, what we have helped empower our community to do, how women are taking control and transforming their own lives and using their, you know, self-expression as a mechanism to transform their lives. Um, and we see that come to life and in person at our events. Um, and you really get the uh, really intense emotional sense of how people's lives are changing. But it's a very proactive you know, what, what women are doing with social media and how we're 
working right alongside them. It's incredibly proactive. It's incredibly um, self-directed and, and individualized. Um, so it's really exciting. I could tell you a hundred stories of women who just completely transform their lives and to know that hundreds more are waiting right behind those women to do it themselves and there's a, you know, there's no one right answer and people are, are doing it in a lot of different ways. And that, um, and then understanding how much the sort of, um, institutions in, this, in the United States, anyway, are starting to realize that power of women from, you know, I think actually CPG and consumer-based companies were the first to really take it seriously that women online have an incredible amount of influence and can make or break uh, and help you launch or help to kill a product. Uh, I think they realized it first. I think um, the political, um, you know, the government and, and political mm-hmm. entities also started realizing it, although getting them to move beyond considering it a source of money is hard for any group. Um, and sort of the traditional media is, <laughs> you can tell how much they realize it by how threatened they sometimes seem by it. So I think under seeing that power shift is really exciting. Yeah, because you're you're in it. Mm-hmm. I mean, you really are. You're truly, truly in it. Yeah. What would surprise us to learn about you personally? What would would surprise people to know about you? Um, well, I think what would surprise most people is that I really consider myself an introvert. Um, which I think there's a difference between being introverted and being outgoing. I can be outgoing, and in fact, I I love public speaking. Um, I actually was a theater major in college. That might surprise some people, and so I pursued a career um, in that um, for several years. That was sort of my first career. And so I'm very comfortable speaking, and I'm very – I can be very outgoing, but I'm also very introverted. I have large crowds like the ones I'm about to meet in three weeks at Blogger um, are very difficult for me. And um, what I love about Blogger is that I feel like I'm the host, and therefore my eye is always open for other people who look more uncomfortable than I do so that I can go and, and meet them and make them feel welcome. And that's how I manage my introversion. And I actually started doing that at other people's events. Like I'm like, if I'm in a big party and I've, I'm clutching my little club soda or whatever and I'm saying, okay, I have to stay for 45 minutes. That's what I do. I say, okay, you, need, you need to stay for 45 minutes. And if you haven't connected and, and created, you know, some interaction that's uh, enjoyable, you can leave. But you've got to stay. And then I've started using this, this tactic that I use at Blogger, I look for other people who look like me, kind of alone and, and looking very stiff, and I go up to them and consider it, you know, I can be helpful by going to help someone who looks even more uncomfortable than I am. So I think that would uh, surprise people, not only because I see not going, but because obviously I run these events with lots of people and I'm out talking to people at those events 24-7. So I, I think there are a few people who look more extroverted than I, but actually inside feel more introverted. Before we go, tell us about Blog Her in August in New York. Tell us what's going on. What's going to be exciting there, and what's it look like this year? Well, it's hard to believe, but it's our eighth annual conference. Um, it's going to be about 4,000 people. We are just going to take up the entire New York Hilton, which is actually the largest hotel in New York City. And um, it's incredibly exciting. The one thing about our event that really nobody else can say is it's it's meant for everybody. Every It's for moms who blog. It's for business bloggers. It's for professional. It's for political. It's for personal. You know, we have programming. We have eight or nine or ten tracks of programming covering all of these topics, including technical and the writing, uh, just the writing itself. Um, and so it's really where everybody comes together. It's not targeting. It's it's really saying if you use social media, you want to be here. And and that means we have this incredibly eclectic, diverse group of speakers and an incredibly diverse group of attendees. Um, so the energy of it is just completely, there's such a sense of discovery. It's both like a reunion um, for all the people who come back year after year. And believe me, we we always think how how do we make this conference worthwhile to someone who has been every single year? Why do they keep coming back? But then there's this tremendous sense of discovery, finding the new people. It's why people come to meet people and find, meet their old friends and find new people. Of course, I'm personally excited because I'm going to get to interview Martha Stewart, who I I just am so – I respect her 
as a businesswoman, and I respect what she's done as a brand so much. I've used her as an example when I speak um, for years now, and um, so it's sort of personally incredibly exciting to me that I'm going to interview her for our Friday lunch keynote. And my partner, Lisa Stone, is going to interview one of her heroes, Katie Couric, for our Saturday lunch keynote. So, um, you know, we're both kind of walking on air about that. Well, congratulations, because I could not agree with you more about Martha Stewart, and I've written about her as well. I just think she really is, whatever your feelings about her aside, you know, because people do, she compels a strong, you know, she has this, but I think even that, too, says so much about what she's created and what she's done and what she's overcome really entirely on her own. I mean, mm-hmm. really, from, you know, being a caterer in her kitchen with some cookbooks is starting a cookbook, you know. That's a long way to come. So congratulations to you with that. That's super exciting for yeah, you. Thank you. Yeah, I really um, I couldn't agree more. I just I think the way she has – and, you know, she's really an early adopter on a lot of tech and social media. And yeah. I've been watching her do – and you know, she does her tech tech episodes for her audience, too. So she, I really consider her an evangelist for the kinds of things Blog Her does. And I really can't wait to ask her, like, why um, in in a world where so much of what she does is about the homemade and handmade and do-it-yourself and this kind of – which many people might seem seems might think seems very different. Why did she adopt blogging and Twitter and and all of these tools so early? And 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 how did she she you know she went from a perception of her as a very kind of closed, not very open person to you know the things she blogs and tweets about. She blog, she cut her lip. I, I'll never forget this. Like last year, she cut her lip at like midnight had to go to the emergency room. She had her assistant, like, took photos the whole time. With her big split lip of her getting stitches of, I mean, no makeup, two in the morning at the emergency room, couldn't have been less glamorous. And I'm like, this is why I love her. Like, this is just, hey, this is me. Um, and I, I just, I just want to ask her about that because I feel like um, she really gets it about, <laughs> excuse me, about, social media giving you this window into and this way to connect with other people as just real authentic human beings and I love it yeah yeah well congratulations and have a great time can you give everyone the dates again yeah and any other information so everybody knows to register and get there if there's any tickets left yes there are tickets left it's um, <clears throat> the easiest way to go check it out is blogher.com slash conferences you'll see on the left hand side there's blogger 12 and Healthminder and Pathfinder Day. Healthminder Day and Pathfinder Day are on Thursday, August 2nd, and they're separate, smaller, more intimate, um, targeted events to sort of start as a pre-conference day. Um, and then the main event where the 4,000 people will be is August 3rd and 4th. Um, all of this is at the New York Hilton. Well, thank you so very much, Elisa, for spending some time with us and enlightening us and telling us more about what's coming and where you've been and where you're going. We just really appreciate the time and the education. My and good luck pleasure. in New York. Thank you, Anne-Marie. Okay. Talk to Talk you soon. Take good care. Mm-hmm. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.